if something doesn't make sense or you get curious, uh, please feel free to stop me, let me know. Uh, if you have questions that go beyond the time limit, we can always converse during the next two days that I'm here. Um, so a little about myself. I live in California. Uh, I am a very adventurous person. So every year I try to do one activity that I don't want to do. Um, and so that's the, the hardest one I've done outside of child labor. And <laughs> I also run a women who test group in San Francisco. So if you have friends in that area, let them know, uh, get them in contact. Uh, and I have two boys. One is my son and one is my husband. Uh, I live with them um, and they're awesome. You can also uh, get in touch with me on LinkedIn. So what do I do for a profession? I work for a company called Gardent and we are in the space of cancer detection. We are located in San Francisco. Is there a clicker or? Okay, thank you. Um, we're a public company. We're growing really fast. What do we really do? So our primary product is a liquid biopsy test. What does that really mean? Well, generally when a patient goes to a doctor and colleges to figure out if they have cancer, uh, generally the treatment procedure is to get, uh, do a surgery, get a physical sample of the tissue from the organ that they think has tumor. Our company has developed a technology called liquid biopsy, which basically uses blood. So you would go into a doctor's office, give two tubes of blood, like you would go for like cholesterol test or your lipid test, right? And we use uh, CFDNA or cell-free DNA in your blood to detect very specific areas in your genome and be able to say whether you have a, a type of cancer or not. And uh, in, in addition to that, you're also able to tell which therapies or medicines in the market are best suited for your uh, type of cancer. So our flagship product is Garden360. It's in late stage cancer, uh, and we are working actively on early stage cancer. So uh, what are we gonna talk about in the next 45 minutes? I tried very, very hard to put this together in 45 minutes. I don't think I can cover everything. So again, feel free to stop and talk to me afterwards. But we'll cover a couple of things. First of all, I'd like to give you some landscape of the project uh, that I'm using as a use case for this presentation. Uh, because it's very important to understand what was being built and what were the complications and challenges, just because every product is different even if the same company is building it. And then we will talk about uh, agile methodologies that we used some agile butts, I call them agile butts because it's agile but. And then <laughs> we'll talk about things that we learned were not working, how we improved it, how we improved them again. And we thought we were done, but we weren't. We had some gotchas. And then finally, we'll talk about some learnings uh, through the process. So who here has seen a crime show? Raise of hands. Really, you guys don't watch television? Like, no crime shows? Okay, so all of us have, right? Um, and so the project that I would be talking about is uh, around crime. So my last company that I worked at was Illumina, and it was building uh, the first next generation sequencing forensics product. What does that really mean? Well, we already have this stuff, we're already fighting crime, we're finding people. What is this new solution? Why do we really need it? So um, I joined the team and my dreams were shattered. So uh, in forensics industry and what we see in television is very different. So if you guys saw a crime show and there was a crime where a murder was committed, there was a lot of blood, a lot of evidence. The, you know, people went in, they took the samples, they came to the lab. How long did it take them to bring uh, results for those samples? Give me an average number. What do you think? Five days, one day, two hours. 52 seconds, huh? Two days, okay. Any guesses? No? Okay. Generally, in these crime shows, right, they would go and uh, figure out, they'll bring everything back, and they'll put it in a machine, and they'll get an answer, and then in three days, they'll file a court, they'll, and the case is done. That is not the reality. That is not how it happens, even in the best of situations. So. These are the assumptions that are true to forensics in general. 
So people think that there's enough evidence. If you find DNA, you will catch the guy. Not true. Or girl, sorry. Uh, but doesn't matter. It, it's not true. Uh, <laughs> and the other thing is that the labs, uh, US or international, they're very high tech. Like they're using the best of technology. They have all facilities. We're fighting it out. No, they're not Batmans. Doesn't happen. So they don't have super science. So this is from the show that I love called Bones. I watch it a lot. I still watch it. But they have this, uh, they have this cool 3D animation thing where they'll get a, like a DNA sample and they'll create this whole profile of the victim. No, nowhere even close, maybe in 50 years from now. That is not the reality. So what is really true in the world of forensics and what were we trying to build? So I'm going to go a little biology on you guys. I'm going to try to cover really quickly. So all of us as humans have 22 chromosomes. You get one from your mom and you get one from your dad and you have your sex chromosomes. So if you are a female, you have an XX. If you are a male, you have an XY, right? In the field of forensics, what they do is, you see those um, yellow markers, basically? These are called loci points. So these are very specific positions in your DNA that the forensic scientists use to identify somebody. Um, how do they identify you? This is a lot of data. But, um, so these are your 13 points. And each point has a very specific type of sequence. So say this is from mom, this is from dad. What does the number 15 mean? What it really means is that in one of my chromosomes at that position, I had a sequence that got repeated 15 times. That's what the 15 means. And the other chromosome, it got repeated 17 times. And so you get a profile for everybody. I have a distinct profile from you, from you, from my cousin, my dad, my mom, whoever. So in this case, in like testing world, this is a happy use case. You have an evidence, you have a two suspects. You can say these guys are pretty much exactly the same. Case solved, awesome. That's not what happens. In reality, this is what the data looks like. What happens is you don't have enough data, right? So you don't get the 13 points to even say this is the person. You only get four. Now, that could be pretty common. Or you might have a weird situation where you have a mixed sample. So if you have a mixed sample, what do you do with that? You have too much information. You can't really abstract those two things out and say, this is from this person or this is from this person. And even though all of these things exist, uh, if I was to get all 13 points with all two markers, it's one in a trillion chance that it would be the same with another person. So, it's pretty robust, but you're still not there. So you'll solve good cases if you get all the data, but not always. And then there are some edge cases, like identical twins. So for identical twins, it's exactly the same. You cannot distinguish between two identical twins. So if a twin committed a crime, and the other twin wants to help him, or doesn't want to help him, he can say, he did it. It's like, no, he did it. And they cannot convict. And this is true, you can Google it up. Um, and the next one that I want to point out is Golden State Killer. So this dude was in California committing crimes for I don't know how long. Uh, he got convicted after 30 years. 30 years. And he's killed so many people. Why? What was the big deal? Like he, if he's committing crimes all over, we should have enough evidence. The reason was that he uh, didn't leave enough evidence. He was in the, he was in, uh, I think he was a police officer. And how they found him was through a fourth generation uh, descendant. And this was outside of the regular database and the regular points that you use on the, on the DNA. So they use data that's not generally used. Does this all make sense? Okay, so what were we building? We were building the first solution ever in the field of forensic. This does not exist. This is like iPhone before it got launched, right? In regulatory space. <laughs> We, we were building a solution. You can think about it like a deconstructor. Um, so imagine a machine somewhere in the future where you put like a burger in it, and when it comes out, it gives you the entire recipe, right, and every single thing. So for our solution, we didn't have just those 13 points. We had, if I remember correctly, about 30-something. Uh, and in addition to those 30-something, we also had what are called SNPs, which are like single, small, little changes in your DNA. So in total, 200 points. So you have a lot more data to, to play with. So if you have 
lost uh, evidence or if you have mixtures, it's much easier to analyze this information. So here's a good example. So imagine this uh, in the identical twin case. So in old technology, capillary electrophoresis, you will only see 11 and 12, right, for um, this specific position. With our technology, you could actually go and say, hey, what's inside that 12? What is the sequence inside the 12? And you'll notice here that there's a C here and an A here. See that difference? That differentiates between those identical twins. Does that make sense? OK, cool. So we're building this product. Nobody knows how it's going to go. It's in research mode. And we decide we want to use Agile. So this was more of a team decision. This was not something that was forced or we were trying to change. This is something a little different than what most companies are trying to do. It was a, it was a joint decision. You want to do Agile. The main reason why we wanted to do Agile was because of the unknown. Because Agile allows for unknown. We were building a product that we did not know how the customer would react to. We did not know what we needed to build. We, well, we know what we needed to build, but we didn't know how it should look how it should interact with the customers. We didn't have all that stuff flushed out. It was a brand new product. It was a brand new market uh, for this company to go into. So the main reason we decided was the unknown. There are many reasons why somebody would want to do Agile. But this is important. The reason I point this out is it's important for you to know why you need to go Agile. I've had conversations with people, and sometimes people say, isn't that what everybody's doing? And my answer is maybe, but is this the right, is this really the right platform for you to use? Like what is the reason you want to do it? So something for you guys to think about. So fine, we went agile and we are in regulated space. Um, my, the company we were doing this at, Illumina, uh, it's a leading provider in sequencing instruments. They've, they've built many medical devices before. And so for us, the regulatory body here was the FDA. And that's not a big deal. Sure, we're going through this whole process. However, for this specific project, FD is not the regulatory body. It's a completely different compliance, completely different regulations. So it's a little different. And we have our processes, we have our procedures, we have all of these things, all of these things set up. So as a team, we decided to go agile. But my SOP, my work instructions, my SDLC lifecycle, all of that stuff talks about waterfall. Huh? What? What did I miss? Didn't we say we were going to go Agile? Sure, my team said we were going to go Agile. Did the company say we were going to go Agile? No. Big problem, OK? Now, everybody on the team, so this is a big team because of all the small components that you got. There's a team, uh, like chemistry team, that's involved in extracting, making sure that we, we are able to extract as much DNA as we can. There's a team that's building the hardware, the sequencer. There's a team that's building the software. There's a team that's building the data analysis or bioinformatics part of it. There's lots of stuff happening. All of these things, all of these teams think, they really think and they believe that they're doing agile development. They also think their way of doing agile development is the right way of doing agile development. Okay. And to top of that, they think their priority is the highest. So a good example would be software is a common thing that's going to be used across, right? And so the chemistry person comes, hey, you know what? I really need to start seeing these sequences in the software. The bioinformatics teams come and say, you know what? We started processing 96 samples now. Have you done any performance testing? I want to give you some more data. Another team says, I want to integrate with the hardware. Everybody has their own priorities. And software team has their own priorities. Software team's like, no, we want to work on the login page. What are you talking about? So everybody has their own priorities. Everybody is doing their own agile. And the organization at the high level is completely somewhere else. So that brings me to the elephant. There's this huge elephant in the room, and nobody's acknowledging it. Everybody's like, yeah, we're doing it. We're going agile. But nobody's acknowledging the elephant. So what did we do? We brought it up multiple times. So just something, this is not a one-day process. This is just something that this team went through. We really had to acknowledge the elephant as a team. We had to acknowledge that, yes, there is a problem. There's a problem and multi-layered system. It's all over the place, right? We had to start accounting for business-level artifacts. It's a much bigger 
a challenge to change uh, the culture uh, when you are talking at an organizational level, right? So you're still doing Scrum, you're still doing Agile, but there might be deliverables at the business level because you have phase gate exits or whatever. We had to start accounting for those because somebody on the team is actually going to spend their time working on that presentation that they have to talk to senior executives about, right? So we had to do that. We had to start estimating, tracking, and accounting. The most important thing that we did was we assigned one product owner. Now this person is not an, he's, this person is an expert in forensics. They're not an expert in chemistry. They are not an expert in software development. So if you want to ask them what's the best way of architecting software, they may not know. But they know the vision. They know where this is heading. So one single person who decides and has the authority to say yes or no, right? We assigned scrum masters. So these individual teams got one scrum master each. And this could be anybody. This doesn't have to be the software development lead or it literally could be anybody who's willing to do that work, right? And some point of contacts. So if you have integration points, like testing is one of the things that just needs to happen across the board. So there has to be a point of contact. But then this was advertised and talked about so that everybody understood that this is the structure irrespective of the structure in your organization. I might be reporting to whoever does not matter. When the product owner says it's priority one, that is priority one. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So we move on. The next thing that we had to do was before anybody could do any development. So this is, this is through the process. It's not like we haven't started developing a product. The development's already starting. We are like starting to do stuff, but we're realizing all these things are happening. So we had to start alignment at a higher level. The individual team owners had to align first. They had to align before they could say, hey, this is what you're building. So it's the product owner's decision to say, okay, this is highest priority. Once you have that, you align, and these teams had different goals uh, and different sprints. They not necessarily they aligned time-wise, but every team had a sprint goal. This is what we're trying to achieve. And there was a lot of negotiation. So this is not an easy meeting where somebody hands you down a list of things that you're going to go, nope. Lot of negotiation during that planning meeting. So this was really the product owner understanding the complexities or trying to understand the complexities that these teams are uh, trying to fight, right? And uh, getting all the leads involved. So getting different eyes on this, not just the scrum master, but somebody from test, somebody from uh, user design, somebody from marketing, so that everybody's aligned. Once we did that, once we did that pre-work, the team started to crunch. We were, we were sprinting before that, but they're, they're crunching, they're sprinting. We're doing awesome. It's, it's beautiful. And we're done. Presentation's over. We have a beautiful Scrum Agile model. You guys can go home. No, I'm just kidding. So <laughs> we think we are doing awesome, right? We're doing these demos. We have these retrospectives. We are doing all, all things that you can think are activities that you need to do during Scrum, right? So it's, it's beautiful, it's working perfectly, everybody's really happy. And then one day, uh, we have a demo, and one night before, one of the developers pings me and he's like, hey, Aprajita, you know that feature that, I'm, that I developed this sprint? I need to demo that. And I'm like, okay, what do you need then? And he's like, okay, you know what? I, I need this specific type of sample so that I could demonstrate it. So I'm like, sure, I can populate it for you. Okay, bye, good night, fine. The next day in the demo, uh, right before the demo, I tell him, hey, Dan, uh, just remember to click on sample A. He's like, yeah, yeah, I got this, I got this. So he went in, and he starts doing this demo. He clicks on sample B. And the software comes crashing down. And everybody in the room is like, what? What just happened? These are stakeholders. These are product owners. They're like, They're like what? I thought you guys were on like two weeks. What is, what's happening? There's chaos. Everybody's terrified. We somehow could get out of that demo. That retrospective was the bet, best retrospective that team ever had. Skeletons literally came out of the closets. Test team was upset. They were like, you guys give us a development build two days before we're supposed to do the demo. How are we supposed to test it? The developers are like, this is too, too complex. I somehow got it working. We have five P1 bugs in the backlog. What are you guys talking about? This is not really working. So we 
were kind of faking it. We were making it look good. We were making agile look good. We were making software development look good. But in a compliance environment, is it really a shippable product? No, it isn't. Oh. So what were we shipping? I don't know. Have you guys ever experienced this, where everything is almost done? Right? Who can relate to that? OK, perfect. That is exactly what we were doing. We were getting everything almost done, right? But we were burning it. Our velocity was beautiful. It was consistent. It was amazing, right? So once we strike that, and once we realized, we had to really think about what are we trying to do. And that's why I say you have to build it like you mean it. The only thing that if you want to take out of this, this presentation is to build a shippable product in your regulated environment. If it's not, if you can't ship it in that environment, it's not shippable. Do you see what I mean? It is not an update to a Facebook page where you can now do a heart instead of a thumbs up, right? It impacts somebody's life or it impacts something else, right? So we started getting the team involved. This is probably the hardest thing is cultural change. Getting the entire team accountable for that product. And this takes time. So it's not going to happen overnight. But we started to add something called acceptance criteria for a story to even make it into the sprint. So imagine the situation before your sprint planning, before your grooming, like after your grooming and before your sprint planning, if there's a feature, login page, the team responsible for working on that feature is going to go sit with the Scrum Master two minutes meeting, and he's going to pull up the story, and they're going to discuss it. And they're going to say, okay, developer's going to say, I have all the requirements that I need. Hester's going to say, I have everything I need. Oh, wait, I don't have the data. You cannot pull it into the sprint. If this team says it does not have all the information it needs to get that thing done, you do not pull it into the sprint. You don't even discuss it during planning. It's Scrum Master's responsibility to go to the product owner and say, I'm sorry, I messed it up, not the team. That was quite crucial. The second thing was definition of done. And this is very, very important from testing perspective because we had to start doing definitions around automation. Are we going to automate this feature? Is, everybody's, is everybody in agreement? Is the developer going to make it automatable? Are they going to put components in the code so that it's easy to automate? Or are we just going to manually test it? Everybody had to agree on it. And we did a, we did a lot of things, but it, this included documentation. So if, you're, if we are, like if this is the final aspect of the feature, it has to be documented and done, right? So that is also part of the definition of that. But the, the, the impact that definition of done had on this team was, if every single thing, on the definition of done is not met, you cannot demo it. That was a very hard sell. So this took us some time, but it's really the cultural and the behavioral change within the team members of supporting each other that got us to the point of being able to ship it to the level that we did. So that's all agile, now talking compliance. Sorry, I completely skipped this slide just because I'm very close to my time. So we're developing this. We're almost, we have all these features. We're starting to do UAT testing. Now I have to go talk to a regulatory team member or a quality team member in my team to be able to ship this, right, internationally or anywhere so that I meet all the regulatory standards that, that exist. And this is what they told me. I've never done Agile. I don't know how to work with this. I don't know how to put this submission. It's a problem. I don't know. I don't even know if they support it. So this is what I generally point them to. I know this is from FDA and there are people from outside the FDA, but this is what it means. FDA or these regulatory bodies, they understand the value of doing concurrent engineering. I'm not going to read that. But what, they, what it basically means is building something constantly and getting feedback, right? That they acknowledge that fact. So it's not a new concept. So how do you do it in the Agile model? So this is my way of presenting it. You need to go back, be able to go back to your organization and say, hey, in Waterfall, for design inputs, for design outputs, 
this is how it maps to agility. This is how I'm doing that work. I'm still doing that work. I'm just not doing this in four blocks. I'm doing it constantly. How? So when you do product planning, sprint planning, sprint retrospective, those are all design and development planning stages, right? You're just doing it all the time. Design inputs, those are your product backlogs, your sprint backlogs, your user stories. All of those are your design inputs. Your design outputs are acceptance criteria, testing, and you, you are doing code and design reviews, those are your design reviews. Design changes, you're getting customer feedback. You're demonstrating this to your product owners. You're, you, you might even be doing UAT, you might even be doing validation. All of that stuff is uh, part of your design change. And you're doing risk management because every single sprint you're discussing the priorities of your features. You're doing every darn thing on that list that a regulatory compliant body would ask you to do. So we got there. However, the biggest chunk for any organization or any team would be to optimize. So if you have to optimize, optimize behavioral changes. This takes time. But if you do it right, you get your team in that mindset, you can do it. Second is you need to build your process. You really need to know how you're going to do it and you need to align people on that process. It might look different from what your company is doing right now, but you need to know what you're doing. You can change it, but keep everybody involved. Build your tools. So we used all sorts of tools. We were using Jira, Confluence, Jama, you name it. But we didn't use them out of the box. We had to customize it for whatever process we defined we will use it for. Like we had to customize it. So you have to put some investment into it. Um, and build your workflows. Like how are you going to do, how are you going to manage, uh, so if there's integration testing that needs to happen. How are you going to align that between four scrum teams? You have to plan this out. So why did we start working on this project in the first place? Because we wanted a better product for the customer. And we, multiple times it happened that we lost sight. So remember the why. Remember why you're building something. So in this case, because we wanted to constantly be getting feedback, right? We were performing UX testing or UX workflow testing. And what that would mean is when we had uh, features developed correctly, we would put it in a room and we would invite researchers, scientists, and other collaborators to come in and try our software. And somebody, somebody would just sit and watch them. And that gave us a lot of feedback. We shared the software with internal and external customers, so it would sort of validation, right? So they're performing like a user. So these were all activities that you can do in parallel without impacting and still receive feedback and improve. Clarify everything. Clarify for our customers. If you're not sure why something is happening the way it's happening, clarify. Acceptance criteria for your stories to make it into a sprint. So this is a hard mark for what your team works on. You have to hold a very high level uh, and a heavy, uh, high standard. You also have to have a high standard for definition of done. So what did we learn today? You need to define your compliance. Your company might be following something else. You might be doing something else. You need to find the delta and you need to bridge the gap, if there is a gap, right? And you need to bring them on board. This is the challenge I'm facing. This is how I'm going to solve it. Define your agile. You need to work with your team. Oh, I completely forgot to, forgot to mention something. We also got Scrum trained as a team together. And that helped because people had their own vision of how they were going to do Scrum. And I'm not saying one way is better than the other, but that just helped us align as a team of what acceptance criteria means, what definition of dance means, what is a product owner, what, how does a Scrum master work. So that training actually really helped. So we defined how we were going to do agile. We were not just making shippable products, we were trying to keep customers at heart and perform constant feedback uh, during the building process so we could de deliver the best product. Get the team involved early. So I hear a lot, get the tester involved early. No, get the team involved early. You have to think as a team. If you don't think as a team, no matter how many testers you have on the team, it's not going to work. Account for all deliverables. So if you're in a regulatory environment and you have to ship with 52 documents, account for that on your backlog. Scrum cannot fix culture, right? It's just a mechanism that can improve it. So if that's what you're trying to achieve, it's going to be hard. And change is hard and it takes time. 
So be patient with your team, uh, continue to do what you're doing, and ask for help when needed.